So in the last recording, I talked about KVP. Now we're going to talk about MA time and mass. So MA is the, uh, directly controls the quantity of electrons that we um, accumulate on the, on the filament and eventually send across the tube to interact with the anode. What we refer to MA is intensity, and if you think back to some of your um, some of your formulas, your mathematical formulas like uh, Ohm's law, V equals IR, as voltage is equal to intensity, which is amperage times resistance. And then if if you're thinking about um, things like uh, your inverse square law, intensity one over intensity two is equal to distance two over distance one squared. So uh, amperage is, is your intensity, and intensity in this case is identified as the number of electrons that you create. So your MA specifically is responsible for heating the filament. So it provides the electrons on the filament to heat the filament up to create the space charge. It results in your thermionic emissions. Remember, at this point, you don't have uh, X-ray exposure. You don't have tube current. The only thing that you have present in the prep stage is heating of the filament and rotating the anode. So what you've got is creation of the space charge, thermionic emissions. So it, it occurs before exposure. It's controlled in the low volt, voltage circuit. So when you set your MA, what you're actually selecting are the different contacts on the low voltage circuit before um, the voltage is stepped down. Now, the reason we step it down and we only use 25 volts to heat the filament is because all we're interested in doing is heating the filament at that point. The distance between the filament and the anode is not very far. So if we use 110 volts, 120 volts, or even 220 volts on the filament, um, we very well could get with the creation of a large space charge um, flow of electrons from cathode to anode. We don't want that. We want to keep all the electrons on or around that filament. So we're going to use 25 volts tops. So um, whenever we set our MA, we set our uh, MA selector, and then it goes into the step-down transformer so that we'll, we'll wind up with low, low voltage and, and a amperage of 3 to 5 amps. So it's, we don't have mass until we make our exposure and send the electrons across the tube. So at that point, um, we've, we apply the seconds, and the seconds represent the length of time that the electrons are traveling across the tube at any given MA. So now we'll talk about um, how MA and eventually mass affects the brim spectrum is as follows. So brim spectrum, we're looking at page 130, figure 7-11. So whenever we change brim spectrum, keep in mind that the only thing that affects the, the minimum energy and where the position of the brim spectrum starts on the far left-hand side, the only thing that affects that is filtration. So if the only thing that affects minimum energy is filtration, then MA does nothing to it. The only thing that affects maximum energy or peak energy is KVP. So if the only thing that affects peak energy is KVP, then MA does nothing to the peak energy. Three things affect average energy. One is KVP, one is filtration for opposite reasons. If uh, we eliminate low energy photons with filtration, then naturally what we're left with is higher average energy photons. And if we increase KVP and we add high energy photons, then what that gives us is more high energy photons. And in both of those cases, I'll, I'll use analogies of test questions. So if you have 10 tests and I throw out the lowest, your lowest test grade, what that gives you is a higher average. Or if you have nine tests, you've done okay on them, you scored 80s, and then you take another test and you score 100, then your average increases. 
So by adding peak energies, average increases. By eliminating low energies, average increases. Um, the third thing is uh, change from single phase to a three phase or high frequency generator type would also change your um, average energy. But MA in time does nothing for average energies. So it does nothing. The effects of the height on the spectrum bubble, yeah, we've, we've got an increase in height. And again, if you look at figure 7-11, you see that. So um, everything under the bubble represents the number of x-ray photons that we create. So we get a, a an increase, a direct increase in, in numbers whenever we increase our, our MA or our time, either one. So the effects of the position on the bubble uh, really is the average, so it, it doesn't do anything for us. So control of density. Remember, density equals exposure. On film radiography, there was a direct correlation between mass and uh, density. So whenever we increased KVP, we did increase density, providing we didn't change our mass, but we messed up the, the imaging characteristics of the x-ray beam. You could truly see a change in contrast whenever you increase KVP or decrease KVP. So the, the only thing that, dent, that mass controlled was density. KVP controlled density and contrast. Mass only controlled density. So it was our direct control of density. In, Computer applications it directly controls our index number, and there's a direct correlation between mass and the index number. So if you double your mass, then you should see a change in your index number on a factor of two. In other words, if you're working with a system where your exposure goes up, your index number goes down. If you shoot with an index number of 400, your um, your image shows an index number of 400 after one exposure. If you double your mass, your index number should go down proportionally. So it should go from 400 to 200 since you doubled your mass. So there's still a direct correlation between the intensity at the image receptor and your mass value uh, and your index number. So it uh, is direct control of quantity at the image receptor whenever penetration is right. So what I mean by that is if you've got not enough KVP to penetrate something, then you can't overcome it with the, the lack of penetration with mass. If you don't penetrate anatomy, then no matter how much mass you apply to the, to the x-ray tube and then expose the patient to, you're never going to get to penetration. So you can't um, increase penetration with, with mass. So overall mass and contrast. So assuming that penetration is good, then um, mass should have no effect on contrast until you get to the shoulder or toe portion of the H and D curve where you've so overexposed the, the image receptor that the image receptor is flooded with information and it can't discern tissue types or you've underexposed to the point that you can't see any kind of, of contrast between tissue types. So only in the extremes, uh, extreme high end exposure and extreme low end exposure will you see mass making any kind of a a change in contrast. There are two ways that mass can affect your geometric factors. One is on sharpness of recorded detail. So if you utilize very long prep times, then what you can do is exceed the focusing cup's ability to compress those electrons and focus them onto uh, the focal tract of the anode. That's what we call blooming. So if you stand on the rotor button and you overheat the anode, then or overheat, overheat the uh, cathode in the 
filament, then what you can have is a, a space charge that's too big. It's bloomed out past the, um, the filament. So when you make your exposure, you effectively create a larger focal spot, uh, actual focal spot, which gives you a larger effective focal spot. So it increases the, the focal spot size and uh, decreases your sharpness for recorded detail with either uh, overheating the, the, the filament blooming of the space charge or using a, a very high MA station. Uh, both of them can do the same thing. And the other thing is if, if your mass value gets too low, be it by increasing KVP or increasing the, the speed of the image receptor, um, then you can introduce quantum model. And of the two factors between time and MA, it seems like sometimes the, the time on CR systems is certainly true in film, time played a bigger role. On DR systems, I don't know that that holds true anymore, but uh, previously, if, if you made an exposure so fast that your image receptor could not pick up the signal, um, then you would get no exposure at all. So uh, of the two, in previous years anyway, in previous technologies, uh, time seemed to be a, a bigger issue than what MA, MA was. So uh, another way that mass potentially can affect your geometric factors is if your time component is too long and you introduce motion. Motion is the, the number one thing to to grade the sharpness of recorded detail in the image. So what you would want to use is reciprocity to limit the, uh, the exposure time as much as you can. And if, if you get to a point where you can't uh, use reciprocity, increase MA and, and decrease time, then what you could do is increase KVP to reduce overall mass. Again, though, in both of those cases, you may introduce some quantum model issues. So when to change mass? First thing that you would want to do is, is look at your image. Is there a quantum model present? Um, what is your index number? Was your collimation right? Was your centering right? Uh, you're going to have to look at a lot of different factors in previous years, in film especially, it was immediate ob immediately obvious if, if your mass was too low. What you had was just underexposure. So if you had penetration, if you could see through all the structures that you needed to see, but the film just came out too light, then all we had to do was increase our mass. Now we've got to look at a number of different things. If you just look at your index number, as we saw in the, the experiments, this week, if you just look at your, your index number and you don't pay any attention to collimation, then it affects, a, collimation affects a lot of things. If you don't look at your centering, um, the, the centering uh, can also, especially if you got off-center collimation on extremity work, the centering can also play a part in uh, how your index number is, is presented. So you got to look at everything. Is quantum model present? If quantum model is present, then you got a lack of mass. But if your collimation looks good, if, if you've got e equal collimation and your anatomy is in the center of your collimation and your collimated field is in the center of your image receptor and your index, index number indicates a underexposure, well, then it would be time to change mass. If you've got, uh, again, presence of quantum model, it's time to change your mass. How much mass should you change? Well, it depends on what your index number shows. If your index number shows that you underexpose the patient, if your ideal index number is 200 and your index number is 400, then it's time to change your mass, providing your collimation is good um, and your centering is good. So if you need to bring it down to 200 and you're working on a system where it increases in exposure, give you a decrease in index number, your index number should have been 200, you got 400, then you would double your mass. Use the mass that you used before, but double it. 
Um, and also, you know, if, if your index number came out to be 100 and it needed to be 200, then what you would do is cut your, your mass in half. So if you're using a, a system where there's a direct correlation between exposure and index number, and sometimes those, those systems use a, a different um, number system to represent the, the uh, ideal exposure. So if your ideal exposure is 2, and what you got was four, then what you would need to do in that case is re reduce your uh, mass in order to bring your index number down. So uh, there should be a direct correlation between your index number and the, um, the, the technique change that you would need to make in order to, to uh, correct for under or overexposure. In some systems, you may have to increase your mass to bring your number down. In some systems, you may have to decrease your mass to bring your number up. And some systems are, are exactly the opposite of that. So look at collimation. Um, if, uh, if your index number is off by just a little, by 30%, let's say, and you need to repeat for a different reason, okay, then go ahead and change your technique. But if, uh, if it's worth repeating for the most part, it's worth uh, either cutting your, your mass in half or doubling your mass if you just repeat for that. But if, if you need a 30% change, I'd be hard pressed to make a, a change in exposure based on 30%. Or if you needed a, a change in KVP, it would be 5%. But if, if that's the only thing that's matter with your your image, I would be kind of hard pressed to, to make a second exposure and re-expose the patient based on a, a barely visible change. Even on film, 30% is a barely visible change. So that's what this, uh, this is referring to. So if, if you need to change by a lot, you know, if you need to double your exposure, then you're going to go up by a factor of 2 or 15%. Um, in KVP. So it's a factor of two, that's a 100% change. Or if, if you, uh, if you overexpose the patient and need to repeat because of the overexposure, then you need to cut it back by at least a factor of two or reduce your KVP by about 15%. The problem with, with changing the, the KVP is that it might affect the grayscale. So it might affect your contrast. What if you are grossly over or under exposed. So again, you need to know your, your equipment and what does the index number mean? Um, if you have a 200 as ideal and your, um, your index number for your exposure came up to 50, and you're working on a system where increases in, in exposure give you a decrease in index number, what that indicates is you've overexposed the patient. So you need to bring your exposure down. So if you have your exposure, then what that's going to do is it's going to elevate your index number to 100. But you need to be at 200, so you need to cut your exposure in half again to elevate it up. So um, you, what you would need to do is, is reduce your mass by a factor of two, and then re reduce that by a factor of two as well. Specifically, if you needed to change your mass for a quantum model issue, then what you may have to do is, is a number of different things. If you have the proper exposure to the image receptor, and you can't really do anything with your mass, what you may have to do is decrease your KVP so that you can increase your, your mass. Uh, what you're looking at there is a 15% rule. You would decrease your KVP by 15% so you can double your mass. mass. If motion was present, again, uh, if you were using a very high or a relatively low KVP, what you could do is increase your, your KVP and reduce your overall mass. Again, you might introduce quantum model. Or if you're working on a system that seems to be sensitive to time, 
then your exposure time is extremely short, and you might want to use reciprocity. And what we're going to find out later in the semester whenever we talk about quality control is that extremely short exposure times tend to be inherently inaccurate. Even when you're using electronic timers, very short exposure times tend to be uh, pretty inaccurate. So even if your system's not, say, uh, sensitive to those, those short exposure times, uh, by virtue of their inherent inaccuracy, it still can introduce quantum model. So distance, <clears throat> SID. What, uh, the, the reason that changes in intensity occur with changes in SID is because the beam diverges. So you back up from 40 inches to 80 inches, you double your distance, the light field that you would be using at 40 inches spreads out over an area four times as large. So it spreads out over a bigger area and then you collimate down to the, the size of the anatomy that you need to see. And what you're left with is one fourth of the intensity of the x-ray beam. So you increase your distance, you increase your SID, you decrease your intensity if you do nothing else. So that's how the inverse square law works, is that the intensity changes inversely proportional to the square of the change in distance. But what we use to compensate for the inverse square law is the direct square law. So if we uh, double our distance, light spreads out to an area four times as large, we eliminate three quarters of that, we only use a, a small portion of it, we're using one fourth of the intensity of the x-ray beam the original x-ray beam. So what we need to do to get the same exposure as we increase distance is increase our technique, our mass by a factor of four. So direct square law and the inverse square law are really the same thing. The inverse square law, usually uh, your questions relating to the inverse square law have to do with uh, changes in dose. So in a lot of cases it's asking things like uh, your dose at one foot was X number of MR. What is your dose if you you increase your distance two feet? Now you double your distance, so your dose rate decreases by a factor of four. Um, how to, to spot the direct square law questions is that it's asking for compensation for mass. Um, you change from 40 inches to 72 inches. What is your new mass? That's your direct square law. Inverse square law questions are uh, changes in, in radiation exposure. So when we're going to change our SID, it's really relatively rare. Um, most exams, we're going to use 40 inches, but um, for exams where we've got an increase in OID, we're going to use an increase in SID, lateral C-spine, chest x-rays. But some other um, exams, you might need to use an increase in, in SID, not because of the increase in the OID, but because of, of how sharply the beam diverges. And you need to include anatomy on the image receptor that would be projected off because of that wide angle divergent central ray at 40 inches. Um, acromia clavicular joints would be a, an example, AC joints. If you're doing AC joints on a, a full-grown man, you might not be, and he's got broad shoulders, you might not be able to get him on the, the image receptor at 40 inches. So you can back up to 72 inches and you'll probably get him. But, uh, you know, aside from that, uh, changes in SID, um, the only examples I could give you is if you had a patient one day that you were shooting chest X-ray on and they were... Um, unable to sit up, you might use uh, 40 inches. And then the next day, they might be feeling better. You might be able to set them up and get 72 inches. So that would be a, an example where you would actually use the direct square law to calculate your, your increase in, in mass with the increase in SID.
there's no real effect on on the brim spectrum. Remember, the brim spectrum has everything to do with emission from the X-ray tube. So when you increase your distance, if you don't change anything, you don't change emissions at all from the X-ray tube. So there, there's no effect on the brim spectrum um, with changes in distance. Uh, if you're phototiming and you increase, then naturally you're you're going to have an increase in output from the x-ray tube but that's not because of the distance that's because of the increase in mass so i know it's it seems to be kind of splitting hairs but there's a significant difference there the distance didn't change the brim spectrum the mass because of the distance did filtration Remember, we have really two types of filtration. We've got inherent filtration and added filtration. And def different textbooks will give you different definitions of what constitutes inherent filtration. Inherent filtration, by the strictest definition, is only the glass that holds the vacuum in the x-ray tube. You could, theoretically, hook up electricity to an x-ray tube that has no housing on it whatsoever and you can make x-rays. They did that in the, the early years of x-ray creation. So it can, it can be done. So that truly is your only inherent filtration, but you can't legally expose somebody to that x-ray beam. What you have to have is you have to have the, uh, a, a protective housing that limits leakage radiation. So inside that protective housing is oil. Um, there's the, the metal housing itself. Even where the x-rays come out, there's a port there that where the, the x-rays come out. There's uh, the oil inside, there's a mirror, and anything that, that you need to add to legally make an x-ray is all considered filtration. Uh, inherent filtration. So on a x-ray unit where you're going to be exposing above 70 kVp, what we have to have is up to 2.5 millimeters of aluminum equivalent. And the equivalent's kind of the kicker here. The oil, even though it's nothing like aluminum, adds some filtration. The glass adds some filtration. The port adds some filtration. The back of the mirror adds some filtration. So there's an equivalent that that you have to get to, and each each one of those things that the, the x-ray beam penetrates through goes into that equivalence. So if the oil in the in the housing, the port, the glass, and the mirror all give you up to the same amount of filtration that 2.5 millimeters of aluminum would give you then you have reached 2.5 millimeters of aluminum equivalent. You don't need any, any additional filtration. That's all inherent filtration. If you need one millimeter of aluminum in addition to all that to get to 2.5 millimeters of aluminum, that's still inherent filtration. If you select an extra millimeter of aluminum to get to 3.5 millimeters of aluminum, that's added. Okay, so anything that brings you up to 2.5 millimeters of aluminum, that's all inherent filtration. If you can't separate the filtration from the, the imaging system, that's inherent filtration. But anything that you add above that is added filtration. So you may be thinking, well, what is tanning? <laughs> well, tanning is added inherent filtration. So as, as the tube ages, um, the filament melts and it coats the inside of the x-ray tube. You can't remove that. It, you can't get inside the x-ray tube and scrape that out. So it becomes inherent filtration. But your physicist is not going to come in and adjust, the, let's say, the, the amount of oil in your protective housing to bring everything back down to 2.5 millimeters of aluminum. It's just not going to happen. So your brand new tube is gonna have 2.5 mill millimeters of aluminum, and that's your inherent filtration. And as the tube ages and it lays down that layer of, of tungsten on the inside of the glass, that's still inherent filtration. 
So inher inherent filtration increases with tube age. Starts out 2.5 millimeters of aluminum and increases a little bit as the tube ages. Added filtration would be uh, not only anything that you add above 2.5 millimeters of aluminum, but also if you were to utilize a compensating filter, that would be added filtration. So the effects on the brim spectrum, we're going to go back to page 131, and we're going to look at the comparison between 2 and 4 millimeters of aluminum. So what you get with the, the increase in, in filtration is the, uh, the, the highest portion of the bubble is pushed towards the, the right-hand side. That means we've increased our average energy. Part of the reason for that is look at the, the very toe end on the left-hand side. And you'll see that the light blue line comes off uh, further to the right with, with high, towards the, the higher energy side. So it increases the, the minimum energy, it increases the average energy, and it pushes everything towards a high energy side. How that affects our intensity is if you look at that bubble, it brings the intensity down. So you're going to have a tendency to, to look at filtration, and filtration says, okay, well, it, it pushes the bubble towards a high energy side. What else pushes it towards a high energy side? Well, KVP does. KVP does, uh, generator top does. So when you change from a single phase uh, machine to a three phase machine or high frequency machine and you do nothing else, then you're going to get double output. If you increase KVP by 15%, you get double output. So if you double your filtration, you're going to make this, this leap. Um, if you double your filtration, then it doubles your output, right? Well, no, it doesn't. So it goes in the same direction as KVP and, and generator type in average but it goes in the opposite direction in output. So if you increase your filtration, what you're going to have to do is increase your, your technique in order to compensate for that filter, for that increased filtration. So what you need to do is increase your mass. You don't want to increase KVP because as you increase KVP, then you increase your average as well there. So the effects on visibility or recorded detail are that since we increase the beam average energy, what's most likely to penetrate through the patient is uh, of higher energy. So we lose a lot going into the patient. We have to reestablish that by increasing our mass. Now what's going to come through the patient is more high energy photons. And with the high en energy photons, a, a larger percentage of that's going to be scatter radiation. So it's going to decrease our visibility of recorded detail and it's going to do nothing to our sharpness recorded detail. So let's run back through this. If you increase filtration and you do nothing else, then what you're going to lose is visibility of recorded detail and you're also going to lose exposure. If you increase your filtration and increase your mass so that you compensate for that filtration, then your uh, exposure to your image receptor should remain the same, but you're still going to reduce your visibility of recorded detail, no effects on sharpness. I want to roll back up to SID uh, just to kind of clarify a couple of things. So I added a slide. Um, whenever we change SID, the, the things that, that change and need to be adjusted for, um, I think, need to be included here too. So Whenever we increase or change our SID, we have a change in intensity to the image receptor. Even though there's no change to the tube out, output, unless we're phototiming or unless we make a change to, to mass or KVP, there is no change to the tube output. So changes in, in SID are independent of changes in tube output. So. Um, the image receptor exposure is inversely proportion, proportional to the square of the distance. So what we need to do to compensate for that is change mass. 
if we don't change mass, then what we're going to have is is either too much exposure or too little exposure. So if if you make an exposure of 72 inches, it's perfect exposure, and you decrease to 40 inches, what that's going to do, if you don't do anything, is if you don't do anything else, is going to uh, give you an overexposure to your image receptor. So if you start out at 40 and you increase to 72 inches and you don't do anything, then you're going to get um, too little exposure to your image receptor. Keep in mind that if you're phototiming, your phototimers are going to adjust for you. So if you if you start at 72 inches, you make an exposure and then you decrease to 40 inches, then you are going to have a change in your output and your image receptor exposure should remain the same. So this is assuming that maybe you're doing portables, you're shooting portables, and there's, um, there's no photo timing. So um, if, if you change your distance from 40 to 80 inches, then you would need four times the mass as what you needed at 40 inches. Likewise, if you changed from uh, 80 inches to 40 inches, you would need one fourth of the mass. And the, the, uh, the change from 40 to 72 inches, remember, is 3.24. If you go from 40 to 72 inches, you need to multiply your mass by 3.24. And if you go from 72 to 40, you need to divide it. So no effect on visibility or recorded detail. There is an effect on sharpness or recorded detail. Um, sharpness or recorded detail is improved as we increase SID. Um, the, the one way that it might, um, might uh, cause a decrease in sharpness or recorded detail is if by increasing your distance, if you didn't change your mass, you might introduce quantum model. Likewise, if you change from 72 inches to 40 inches and the mass compensation causes your mass to be so low that it introduces quantum model, then it's gonna negatively affect your sharpness recorded detail. Uh, but those are kind of far out there what if situations and especially the, the, the change from 40 to 72 inches because if you increase, you should increase your mass, which means you're not going to have quantum model issue. Um, and also remember the effects of the anode heel effect in, in both the difference between um, penumbra, the anode heel effect gives you a worse penumbra at the cathode end of the X-ray tube, and uh, the, the effects as far as density differences or, or intensity differences exposure differences between two ends of the, the image receptor is less significant at increased SIDs. So we talked about types of filtration. Um, the, the inherent filtration again is uh, we've got the anode, um, we've got the glass envelope, we do have uh, inherent filtration increasing in the glass envelope when tanning occurs and it goes through the oil, that's a type of inherent filtration, tube housing, uh, the mirror, and then added filtration is anything that, that is added beyond that 2.5 millimeters of aluminum. And compensating filters are also added filtration as well. We have a couple of different types of compensating filters. Um, they can be pre-patient or post-patient. So any kind of uh, compensating filter is, is compensation for anatomy or to reduce um, patient exposure. So what we have are uh, most commonly wedge filters. And a wedge filter is just a chunk of aluminum that's thin at one end and thick at the other end. And the, the purpose for the wedge filter is to reduce the intensity at one end of the filter, or one end of the anatomy, uh, one end of, of the x-ray beam before it strikes the anatomy, so that if we have anatomy that has a lot of tissue density differences and thickness differences, the, the decreased intensity at one end going through thinner anatomy should even out the radiographic densities on the, the image receptor. So what I mean by that? 
is you got a foot. The foot's wedge shaped. If you put the thick end of the, the wedge filter over the toes, and the thin end over the heel portion of the foot, then what you're going to have before the, the x-ray beam strikes the anatomy is a greater intensity towards the heel end of the um, x the x-ray beam and a decreased intensity towards the toes so that what you wind up with on the image receptor is a similar intensity striking the image receptor on both ends so the purpose for the wedge filter is to even out tissue density differences a trough filter really doesn't accomplish the same thing it's really radiation protection and where we see a a trough filter is it's kind of like two small wedge filters so that the the skinny end of the wedge is on both of them are pointing towards each other and where we use that are on scoliosis series primarily so on a scoliosis series we're trying to make a diagnosis of the curvature of the spine and most of the time it's going to be on young women uh, teenage girls maybe even uh, adolescent girls and so in order to, to save the radiation dose, we're going to do two things. We're going to do a, a spinal series, but we're going to shoot the patient PA. And then we're going to use those trough filters to try to, uh, to provide some very hard collimation so that um, the, the thin portion of the filters may be penetrated, but they're going to be penetrated with a higher average energy x-ray beam that's more likely to penetrate through the patient. Remember, back to your radiation protection, any x-ray photon that penetrates through the patient doesn't deposit all of its energy inside of the patient. Where the patient dose is highest is when the x-ray beam and the individual x-ray photons are absorbed inside of the patient and lose all their energy. So if the patient's more likely to emit the x-ray photons, then the dose to the patient goes down. So that's a trough filter. Post-patient collimators or compensating filters are basically beam attenuators that do the same thing as a wedge filter. So again, back in the day uh, that we were uh, using film on our shoulders, what happened whenever we phototimed in a lot of cases was that the greater tubercle would be burnout. So they had what they called a boomerang filter. And for obvious reasons, it was, it was kind of shaped like a boomerang. And you put that over the superior and lateral portions of a patient's shoulder whenever you're shooting, shooting AP internal or external rotation shoulders. And it worked just like a wedge filter. The downside to using these is because they, they are behind the patient and we might have to adjust our technique to compensate for the filter being there then they're probably going to increase the patient dose a little bit with a wedge filter yeah, it's tough to say since it's filtration it brings it down but our our tube output before the the filter had to go up pretty dramatically most of that was going to be absorbed inside of the patient so it's kind of a wash but if we have something like a, a post-patient um, co uh, compensating filter of some sort, that's probably going to increase the patient's dose. So, effects on emission and on the um, brim spectrum is going to push the bubble towards the high energy side. So you got high uh, average energy. It eliminates a lot of low energy photons, so our minimum energy is at a higher energy than what it was before. So I, I don't want to confuse you by saying that it increases the minimum. What I mean by it increases the minimum is it increases the, the energy level of the minimum x-ray photons. So again, looking on page 131 at figure 7-13, it didn't increase the number of minimum photons, it increased where that that line takes off it it in, increases the energy of those lowest energy photons by eliminating the the lowest energy photons so it does nothing to the peak energy uh, the the average increases because you have fewer low energy photons 
um, it reduces the number of X-ray photons, so we have to co compensate with our mass. And the best measure of beam quality is half value layer because you can have two X-ray beams. One is very highly um, filtered, and they both have the same overall mass value. But if one um, takes more mass to penetrate or uh, if it if it takes more mass to accumulate the same quantity of photons after a half value layer, then that's a lower energy and a lower quality X-ray beam. So just the the looks of the brim spectrum as we add filtration. When you change your filtration, this assumes that you're increasing your filtration. You increase your filtration, you're going to lose some photons. Um, since you lose photons, what you're going to lose is some density or some exposure to your image receptor. As you increase your filtration, then you're going to have a higher average beam energy. What that means is that you're going to have more penetration or the, the photons that penetrate through the patient are more likely to be scatter radiation, so you're going to lose some contrast. Also, before you get to the patient, what you're going to have is a change in the differential absorption. So even if you com compensate with an increase in mass, what you're going to be left with is a, a, a higher average energy x-ray beam post-patient so your differential absorption is going to go down. What you're left with is, is more photons that are likely to penetrate through the patient. So you're going to lose contrast. So you lost density, you increased your, your mass, and now you're going to lose contrast. A dose can really go either way. Remembering that the original purpose for filtration was to uh, decrease patient dose. Um, that, that should, you know, be a a thing to keep in mind any time we're talking about filtration is dose has a possibility of going down with the increase in, in filtration. But if we're talking about uh, compensating filters as opposed to just increased filtration, then it could go up. So now we're going to talk about machine phase. So we've got single phase, we've got three phase, we have high frequency. And single phase can be unrectified or rectified, and it doesn't really matter which one we're talking about. In both cases, what we've got, if you remember voltage ripple, is just, that's just those pulses. So the unrectified, that's a whole wave, um, and there, there is no rectification. So you've got um, electrons trying to go up and down through the circuit, and they're actually trying to go from cathode to anode, then anode to cathode. They probably aren't going to make that jump, and the only place that you're going to see unrectified units would be in dental uh, clinics where they don't have to have the KVP and the potential difference that we use. So you're never going to work with those, most likely. Um, but even with 100% voltage ripple, what we get is a change from 100% of the peak energy all the way down to zero for every cycle. So the average KVP is even lower than what it is for uh, three phase and high frequency. The benefit of three phase is that the average beam energy never drops to zero. So you've got those overlapping pulses. So that gives us a higher beam average, higher average beam energy. The voltage ripple between a six pulse and a 12 pulse, those are both three phase generators, is 14%. And by the time we get to the 12 pulse, it's down to 3%. And what that does is it gives us a, a, a higher consistent average beam energy as measured by KV. But it also gives us a higher output. So we get an increase in MR for the mass that we have set over single phase. High frequency even pushes a little bit further. So we every everything that I just set up about three phase applies to um, high frequency. The difference here is our voltage ripple is down to one percent or less. 
So what that does is gives us an even higher MR to MAS output than even three-phase 12 pulse. The effects on the beam energy is that we get a higher average energy. Our peak energy remains the same, but our, our average increases. So it gives us better penetration for the MR output that we have. So we've got a, a clear increase in beam quality. So when we change from single phase to three phase, we get improved beam quality. From three phase to high frequency, again, we get an increase in beam quality. So it looks like this on the brim spectrum. Single phase, when we increase to a three phase, uh, peak energy remains the same, Min minimum energy remains the same. That's only controlled by KVP, that's only controlled by filtration. What changes is the position of the bubble and the height of the bubble. So we get an increase in numbers and we get a increase in average. When we go to high frequency, it, it increases again. It's kind of insignificant the change from three phase to high frequency, but the change from single phase to three phase changes pretty dramatically. So the the output and the exposure to the image receptor change from a single phase to three phase is a factor of two. So if you shot a perfect technique on a single phase machine, this is how much you would put out. If you change to a three-phase machine and use the exact same technique, then this is how much you would put out. So whenever you change from a single phase to a three-phase to maintain the same exposure, what you need to do is, is cut your mass in half. For, so single phase, three-phase, reduce your mass by two. Uh, cut it in half. Divide it by two. If you're going from single phase to high frequency, you need to divide it by two and a half. So going the opposite direction, if you shoot the, the uh, perfect technique with a, a set KVP and a mass, and this is how much it gave you on a three-phase machine, if you set the same KVP and mass on a single-phase machine, it would be inadequate. So what you need to do when you change from three-phase to single-phase is double your mass. And if you go from three uh, high frequency to a single phase, you need to increase your mass by two and a half times. So, what does it do on the image? Uh, the effects on contrast, since you have a higher average KV, and since KV controls your contrast, then you should have a, a reduction in contrast. Remember, we're using DR. What controls your contrast is not your KV. Um, and even when comparing uh, single phase, three phase machines, uh, the, the actual KVP set between those two would control your contrast more than changing from single phase to three phase. But what truly changes your uh, contrast is your computer algorithm, your lookup table. So density <coughs> or exposure, when we change from single phase to three phase, what we get is an increase in MR output per MAS. Remember, that's if we change from single phase to three phase or three phase to high frequency or single phase to high frequency, we get an increase in the, the MR per the amount of mass that we have set. So the exposure is going to increase. So you need, need to compensate with changes in, in mass. So if you change from single phase to three phase, then you need to reduce your mass. If you change from by a factor of two, so you need to divide it in half. If you change from single phase to a high frequency, you need to divide your mass by two and a half times. If you change from three phase to a single phase, you need to increase your mass by a factor of two. And if you change from high frequency to single phase, you need to increase your mass by a factor of two and a half times. So uh, one more time, the effects on output with increasing machine phase. If we increase machine phase from single phase to three phase, our peak energy is unaffected. KVP is the only thing that changes that. If, uh, if we change from single phase to three phase, our minimum energy is unaffected. The only thing that changes that is your filtration. Your average energy is increased. It pushes the brim spectrum towards the high energy side. It uh, decreases your contrast. If, 
if you don't compensate for it, it increases your exposure. Your beam quality improves and your sharpness for recorded detail decreases. We're not going to talk about tomography in at the end of the chapter. You'll see magnification radiography, which we've already talked about. That's your macro radiography. And we talked about that in class. Much of what we're about to talk about, we've also talked about as well. So patient factors and technique. Whenever we have change in thickness, we usually want to change our mass because um, with the change in thickness, what we're going to have is a, a increase in soft tissue most of the time, which is going to reduce our, um, our contrast. And if we increase KVP, then we also create more scatter radiation on top of the scatter, increased scatter ratio, radiation we had with the increase in thickness. And that's just kind of compounding the, the problem. So we don't want to increase KVP with an increase in thickness. Whenever we have a change in tissue type and a change in ZEF number, uh, most of the time we can use a change in mass. But sometimes if you want to change the, the penetration, if you've truly got a, a change in, in tissue thickness, or not thickness, but tissue type, where maybe you've got a patient with osteopetrosis, where the bone gets significantly more dense, um, you may have to increase your KVP in order to, to penetrate through that. Or likewise, if you're trying to shoot a lateral chest x-ray on a patient with a broken arm, um, you, you might want to increase your KVP uh, because they can't elevate the arm to get it out of the way of the lungs. So with the increase in KVP, you can increase in penetration of that. Most of the time it's going to be mass, but you can have circumstances where you need to increase your KVP as well. Whenever we have a, a pathology, then we've got two different types of pathology. We've got additive and destructive. And most of the time your, your test questions are going to ask you for adjustments in technique, and most of the time your adjustments in technique are going to be mass. So if you have an additive um, pathology that adds patient density, then you would need to increase your technique by a factor of 30 to 50 percent. If, on the other hand, you have a destructive pathology, it becomes more radiolucent, you would decrease your mass by a factor of 30 to 50 percent. And that's because with an additive pathology, it becomes more radiopaque, needs more technique. Um, if our change is, is fluid, then mass is certainly your your go-to um, type of, of technique adjustment. But if you have um, something like your osteopetrosis, you may increase KVP uh, to, to increase penetration of the bone. Destructive pathologies, um, most of the time it's going to be KVP, or uh, it's, it's going to be mass, but sometimes you may want to adjust your KVP to improve your contrast. Like, for example, um, if you've got a patient who's got emphysema, um, the, the patient will be inherently very high contrast with, with emphysema because you got hyperinflation of the, the um, alveolar sacs. So what you might want to do is increase your KVP to tr bring some of that contrast down a little bit if you've got a, a patient with emphysema. A common question on tests is post-mortem films. And po <laughs> you know, post-mortem post films, we're past pathology at that point. But um, what happens with patients in post-mortem is the great vessels in the, the thoracic cavity engorge with blood. Um, sometimes the blood that is uh, in the, the tissue has a tendency to settle posteriorly as well. So what we need to do with post-mortem patients, sometimes you have a tendency to think, well, that's, you know, it's not, nothing's more destructive than death. But actually it's an additive condition uh, because of that settlement of the fluid. So if you ever see a question about changes um, in technique for post-mortem films, you're probably going to have to change your mass by, by 30%. And finally, we're going to get into technique charts. So what we've got in technique charts are 
technique charts for set techniques and technique charts for uh, really things that we don't have to manipulate at all. So barium work, um, you'll run into questions about uh, technique charts and what, what type of technique chart you use for barium work. That's high KVP. Um, you have to have the high KVP to penetrate any portion of the barium. Um, there are technique charts that are variable KVP, and I really predict that this is going to be, become more of a norm um, that instead of changing our mass routinely, I expect that in the future we're going to be changing our KVP as, as more refinements come to uh, DR. But traditionally with, with film, uh, the variable techniques were inherently higher contrast, and what you started off with was a baseline technique. You measure the patient, <clears throat> you set off, or you start with baseline technique at a certain KVP and a certain mass for every exam type. And then you would change your KVP by two KVP per centimeter. So you had to, had to uh, measure every single patient to start off with a baseline KVP and mass. More commonly in screens and films, what we used was a, a fixed KVP variable mass technique chart. So with these, what, what we did was we uh, utilized a, a relatively fixed KVP for, for every body part. Like a hand was always going to be 55 KVP. A wrist was probably going to be 55, no more than 60. Forearm was 60, no more than 65. Same with the elbow. So we had a fixed KVP and what we would do is vary the mass according to the thickness of the tissue. So that's what we traditionally used. Um, oddly enough, you would think that with KVP being the controlling um, technical factor for contrast, that a variable KVP would be lower contrast, but actually variable KVP was a higher contrast. So you're not using those so much anymore. Um, most likely what you're using is automatic automatically program radiography where you select the exam type. And KVP is uh, selected for you. MA is already selected. Filament size is already selected. Uh, photocells are already selected where applicable. So um, that, that's probably what you're using now. But those still use automatic exposure controls. Remember, your AECs are a timer type that requires no operation by the technologist. You make your exposure, you select your, your AECs, which cells you're using, you make your exposure, those AECs detect the amount of radiation that uh, comes through the patient and interacts inside that radiation detector, and it sends a signal over to the timer circuit to discontinue the, the exposure. So what you do if you're not using automatically programmed radiography or APR, is you select your own KVP, you might select your MA, you're probably gonna select the backup time or make sure that you've got plenty of backup time. You'll select your, your photo cells, but you, you won't select the time. You'll probably select fil filament size as well but you're, you're not going to select the time. You're going to select the photo cells and the photo cells are going to take care of your, your exposure. So that if you have a hypersthenic patient, then what's going to happen is your AECs stay on longer to receive the proper amount of radiation before terminating the exposure. If you have an asthenic patient, you're going to, you're going to get to the end of the exposure much faster. So in most cases with your AECs, the variable that changes is your time. Um, it's the, the MA is, is set regardless of which one of these you're using. Uh, the MA for the most part is set. So what happens whenever you have a, a hypersthenic patient is that the exposure time runs up so that you get an increase in mass. If you get a asthenic patient, then it shuts off quicker. You get a decrease in mass.